Good evening, everyone. If you can find your way to a seat, we're going to start with song service. And we're going to start with Love at Home. Now we'll go to our theme song, which is In the Garden.
Good evening. I want to give each one of you a welcome this evening to our evening meeting. And I think a few more have trickled in through the day, and it looks like we are just getting pretty full. It's so nice to see each one of you here. So uh, welcome to our meeting. And as I went to some of the sessions and looked at the, all the choices today of all the different topics of seminars, isn't it amazing the interesting topics that have been chosen? Can you say amen? They're just fantastic. And as we come to our regular sessions together, I find the topics to be so inspiring and our speakers are inspiring. What a blessing to be here. Praise the Lord. And I also want to uh, also welcome those who are joining us by live stream. Welcome to each of you. And might we each be blessed throughout these meetings. I'm going to ask just now, let's kneel together if we're able to uh, have our opening prayer tonight. <clears throat> kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we ask tonight, we see the times that we live in, and we ask that you'll send your spirit to be with us tonight. Fill us, each one. And Lord, inspire us tonight in the talk and in the reports that we'll be hearing to be more like Jesus every day in our lives. Draw us closer to your throne. Bless our speakers also with your words tonight. We ask these blessings in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good evening. It's time for Ad Agra Spotlight. Tonight and tomorrow night, we are going to be spotlighting some of the things that have happened because of the support each one of you have provided at being part of our community. Our first spotlight tonight is going to be the Acquainting Agriculture Team and the work that they've been doing this year. I want to start with a little video so that AV people could please roll that. Malachi, after being born in Australia three months ago and only returning to the States a couple of weeks ago, is over travel. But we'd love to keep you updated in what Acquainting Agriculture has been doing and is up to. Last year we were in 55 schools and 55 homeschools. This year we're up to 135 schools and 200 homeschools. Renee Vandenberg has joined the team as treasurer. We've also made wonderful connections at conventions like ASI and NAD's Teachers Convention that has allowed us to continue to grow um, Acquainting Agriculture's influence globally as well as here. So here is an awesome testimony from a teacher in Lynchburg, Virginia. She teaches third and fourth grade at Desmond T. Doss Christian Academy and she says this. Since I have returned to teaching after being a stay-at-home mom, my guardian has been terrible. As I listened to the presentation, I felt God prompting me, telling me that I needed to do this for my students. I told him he knew I was a terrible gardener. This was a huge project and that I couldn't do it because I was already so busy. As I listened, especially the testimony of a one-room school teacher in New York, the wish kept growing that maybe I could do something small after all. I loved the idea of growing this agriculture movement across all our Adventist schools. The Planting with Jesus book has been so foolproof. I'm following it very closely and it is fantastic. I am so grateful to the team with the vision and hard work to put this together in such a remarkable way. It is obvious that God put on their hearts and he is blessing their efforts. I still have many worries, but I'm sure God has this in his very capable hands too. I'm already finding peace and joy in my heart during this project because I am trusting God to lead it every step of the way. He is the master gardener and he obviously wants us to learn how to do this. People have even given us some small donations. Someone gave me $100. It may seem like a small thing to some, but I was nervous to take this on at the beginning, and God is showing me over and over that he's got this. Every time I started to get overwhelmed with this project, I just remind Jesus that he put it on my heart to do this and that he will have to take care of it. And wow, has he ever done that. And we have another awesome thing going on with Aquarian Agriculture. Listen to what Anna and Melissa have next. Thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate each one of you. To hear from you, Angela, in case you're watching, I guess you do have a good ex excuse for not being here today. But we do have the rest of her team here, and I'd like to start by asking Anna. I know there's some exciting things that are happening. Please share with us. Yes, well, good evening. Uh, I'm one of the contributing writers of the 
curriculum acquainting agriculture. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, I understand the importance of seeing agriculture being revived in our schools, our home schools, and Christian education everywhere. And as a previous teacher, I understand the importance of having a well-written curriculum with lots of teaching tips to help reach the revived agricultural goal. And as a former literature evangelist, I also understand the importance of taking the agricultural blessing beyond our institutions to our surrounding communities to reach those that are hungry, no, starving for the abundant life God has to offer. So without further ado, I would like to present... You want to be Miss Vanna White? <laughs> Fitting. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you a new resource for our literature evangelists to use to offer to their, in their communities. It's called the Everyday Gardener. Uh, it teaches people all they need to know to get started growing right at home. This book is filled with practical gardening knowledge and deep spiritual connections that allow agriculture to acquaint its readers with their creator. So we are proud to announce to you that the Minnesota Liter Literature Evangelist Program will have this book in their young people's bags as they go door to door this coming summer. So that now, thank you, so that now each worker can have a valuable new way to connect with those who need this important message. Wow, isn't that exciting? That people are going to be able to take this door to door this summer. I love that. But I think you have some other plans coming up for this next year. Tell us about them, Melissa. Good evening. Uh, we're very excited about the opportunities that we have with canvassing and for the over 135 schools that we're currently working in. Um, but we're still continuing to work on developing curriculum and working on finishing year B. And year B of the Acquainting Agriculture curriculum has more of a focus on outreach and teaching the students how the decisions that they make really have a ripple effect in their communities. And we're already seeing this effect in the communities as the students are growing at school and then taking it home and growing gardens with their families. And we're even getting reports back of churches who have Members who don't have kids in the school that are also going home and starting gardens and even buying hoop houses because they feel enabled by what they've seen the kids able to do in the school. And so we just really want to thank you all who have supported us to help us come this far. And, um, and as, you, as we continue to grow, we thank you for your continued support. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you so much, Anna. It's great to have all of you here and see what is happening with this project. So next up, we have um, Darren Greenfield, and he's going to share with us what's been going on in Africa. Uh, I understand that the impact of the Ad Agra Conference is international, and he's going to share with us some specific ways in which that's happening with Gardens of Renown. Thank you. Good evening, Ad Agra. And thank you for the um, support of Garden of Renown. This is an Adagra initiative, and um, it was the Lord leading the way. It wasn't any planning on my part or Adagra's part. But um, what, Ade what Garden of Renown is, is taking Adagra, which you all appreciate, to the local church, to the poor people who cannot afford to travel, pay for travel, and to um, pay the registration fee to come to a conference, even though it's so cheap. In, in Ghana. And so what we are doing is we're sponsoring wells and fencing and irrigation material in poor rural areas and, um, and then with the training that Adagra provides, <clears throat> the churches are able to cultivate crops that um, help them generate some income. It inspires the, the church members to get into farming and shows them a way of, of making a living because many of them are unemployed. Um, it's been a huge, huge blessing. Uh, several of the churches have grown tremendously with membership increases, baptisms, uh, with the fresh water. In some areas where water is really scarce, um, people will travel some distance carrying their buckets um, to get fresh water from the Adventist church that has this garden of renown and taking it home. And through those connections, they are actually um, getting the water of life. So. so I'd love to hear, just in 30 seconds, what is that way that the impact of ADRA is being multiplied in Ghana through a new venue? So our late, one of our latest Garden of Renowns was at um, Valley View University, and our vision for this 
I don't have enough time to share it all, but um, basically theology students that are training at Valley View University are getting, some of them are getting trained at the Garden of Renown farm, and they then, when they get assigned out uh, to churches in, in the country, they can take their knowledge and share it with church members and raise up Garden of Renowns that are not sponsored and uh, do it that way. So God is tremendously blessing. And if you want to know more, come to the booth, sign up for our newsletter. There's a QR code you can scan or write down your name, email, and phone number on a piece of paper, put it in the box, and there's a drawing also for a gift card if you'll do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. We really appreciate it. And Ron, just run up here because we want to hear a few last minutes about what is going on with Ruth's mentorship. Those of you that have been with us before are acquainted a little bit with this, but Ron's going to tell us about some plans they have for what they're going to do going forward. Okay. Um, we're really thrilled that we're finally going to meet the two of the needs uh, that AdAgra has identified. Um, one is that you, it to connect experienced growers with those that are trying to learn. And so we've established a mentorship program. Uh, my wife once said when we were trying to accomplish a purpose, she said, I wish I had a friend that's already done this that I could call. And that's what Root Mentorship is really focused on, is to get you a friend that you can call. So tell me about this farm raising thing. What did you just do this last year? So we um, also to, the, it can be kind of lonely and overwhelming when you're out there trying to do country living by yourself. So we've organized small little events where you meet together on somebody's farm and do a project with them. It really establishes bonds of friendship and um, we did that in October up in Oklahoma and we had uh, carpentry work going on, we had children, we had planting strawberries, and um, the, uh, the people that came said it was worth every moment because you really can get a feeling alone and separate. And so that, the, we're going to expand the farm raising events. What's really cool is we're going to partner with Build and Restore. We want to raise up hundreds, if not thousands, of little farms all over the United States that can spread this message. I love that. Thank you so much. And if you want to hear more, stop by the booth and see Ron Carlson with Roots Mentorship. I also just want to take a minute to ask those of you that are seated uh, towards the edges of our two sections here to move towards the middle. We have some people that are looking for places to sit and it's easier if some of you move towards the middle and take up the empty seats. Thank you so much, really appreciate that. Good evening, everybody. I wanted to introduce you to some friends that I've made uh, this past year. I've had a wonderful time at Adagra for several years in a row, and as I've come a number of times, I'm always inspired to meet new people and hear their stories. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with Butler Creek? All right. Would you tell us your names and uh, give us a location where Butler Creek is, and then we'll get into talking about what you do there. Who wants to go first? Hello, my name is Hannah, and um, this is my husband. We are located in South Central Tennessee. Great, not too far from me. Um, tell us a little bit about what Butler Creek is doing right now overall, and specifically, could you give us a little bit of detail of how agriculture is supporting your overall ministerial goals? So we have a small lifestyle center. Uh, we run three programs in our lifestyle center. One is uh, disease reversal, uh, mental health wellness program, and uh, we have a recovery program for substances. Um, in our, we have two apprenticeship programs. Uh, one is on um, uh, culinary ministry. The other one is in um, uh, lifestyle coaching. And uh, agriculture, well, one is part of the school, is part of the program, uh, how to grow vegetables, bring them into the kitchen. Uh, it's, it provides, you know, vegetables for our kitchen and uh, is a key um, role in our lifestyle program. 
Tell me, didn't I hear that you used the acquainting agriculture material in your ministry? Because that was something that was birthed, I, I, I would call it birthed here at, at, at Agra. And I enjoy hearing stories from people that illustrate the ripple effect that occurs when people interact and like cross-pollinate and share the resources that they themselves are creating for other ministries. Could you summarize how it is that you use acquainting agriculture in your own ministry, though you didn't originate the program, you, you, found, you found something about it that you liked, and you said, we got to use this, right? So tell me how it is that you incorporated that where you are at Butler Creek. Yeah, it's very challenging, right, to have good material when you have to put everything together. So it, it was really amazing when we came upon this material because it's wholesome. It has, you know, different aspects, not just, you know, you have health in it. You have, it's just practical, hands-on, and it makes it easier for, for the students. They have great material that they can take home with them and that they can use in being outside, and it's making it also easier for the teacher, right? Yeah. Great. I love to hear that. In the time that we have remaining, could you think of maybe a, a, a significant, uh, impressive story that you could share about perhaps an impact that uh, someone who came to study with you as an intern or student experienced, or maybe a health guest who had uh, a transformation uh, in their spiritual or physical well-being that uh, they enjoyed at, at your facility there at Butler Creek? Well, I have a bunch of them. <laughs> one. I just one. <laughs> okay. Well, um, recently, uh, two months ago, uh, one of our uh, apprentices uh, became baptized. He was, I guess, two years ago. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, he will hear voices. Uh, he has some mania and some other things. He came for three weeks, um, took some things, implemented in his lifestyle, came back again uh, as a student, implemented some more things, went back home, came back this time, surrendered himself completely to God. And uh, I can just, I, I, I'm telling you, I saw it. I cannot believe it. I mean, this guy came completely crazy. Today, he teaches Sabbath school. He is in his mind. You can, I mean, you can talk to him about the Bible, taking classes about Daniel. He understands. I mean, it's amazing. He uh, became baptized two weeks ago. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, at, before you go, I want people to understand that uh, neither of you are physicians, right? So do you have to be a physician to engage in this line of medical ministry? Yes or no? I was a farmer for seven years. So physician, farmer, it doesn't matter. The Lord can use you and your household to do much good. All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for coming up and sharing with our attendees what you're doing. All right. I met Brother Kyle and his family uh, about a year or so ago when I had the ple pleasure of working with the Dysingers on their farm to learn a bit more about the winter gardening. And while we were there, uh, Uncle John gave me the opportunity to go to see his neighbor, who I didn't know anything about at the time, Kyle, and his two sons. Thank you. Could you move a little bit closer? Let's come to the front here. And, um, and so I wanted to, to talk to the young men as well as their, their mentor, their father, about what you guys get to do uh, on your kind of homestead near the Dysinger farm and kind of how you're living. I understand, I, I saw your table in the back and you guys produce uh, wood and other products for sale, is that, that's right? Yes. Would you explain to me what you're, what you're holding in your hand? Tell, tell people what, what this is and where it came from. That's a spoon and I had to carve it and it's, what is it? Oh, black walnut. So that's black walnut. You, your father has a lot of confidence in you if he's going to give you a piece of walnut that size and let you <laughs> cut it up and hopefully make a nice spoon. That's fantastic. Um, do, have you used these at your home to have breakfast? No. Oh, no. They're, they're special, just special occasion, maybe for public sale. Do, and you do the same thing your brother does. Do you help out in, in your father's carpentry shop? You know, Jesus did that. Yes. So you helped. To, did you make this spoon here? Yes. 
That's incredible. You, would you tell me one of the tools maybe that you use to create something like that? What kind of tools do you use? Chisels, sandpaper, and saw. Chisels, sandpaper, and saw. And is that walnut as well? That, that, that looks terribly pretty. Do you have an online store? No. Would, maybe we'll work on that later. Do you have a real storefront maybe though that people can, can see what you have to, to sell? Just the booth. Oh, just the booth. So, the, the, are, okay, these are limited editions then. <laughs> Essentially, is that what I hear you saying? Okay, so folks, these are limited editions. I think you can get the, the craftsman's autographs on them, should you choose. Now, in my line of work, I use knives too, and my surgical friends do a lot of that too with knives and they, and they cut. You have to have good training from someone like the, the gentleman behind you. Um, what's your last name again? Neuro. Neuro. So you're actually neurosurgeons, aren't, aren't you? Because you're, you're using knives and you're, you're like operating on faulty wood and you're creating and bringing out the best of the wood, aren't you? Have you thought of yourself as a neurosurgeon before? No. You, you could start now. And you know, does your dad make business cards? Yes. What are they, what are they made out of? Wood. Oh, that surprises me. Do you think maybe you could bring next year some business cards of your own that says like you're a neurosurgeon and then you could like sell those things, right? So do you have a lot of fun? Tell me how much fun it is to work with your dad in your shop. So much. Do, are you there every day maybe or just like on weekends or? Whenever I can. Whenever you can. I'm sure you probably have some responsibilities for mom and maybe do you do some school at home? Yes. That's fantastic. Kyle. I've, I've been to Kyle's shop, and it's like, I wish I had Kyle's shop. And I wish I had um, uh, some fine young men that I could do some fun things in the shop. So thank you for illustrating for us what it's like to have a really well-run uh, um, industry at home with your own family. If there's any words of encouragement or inspiration you could share with our attendees who are maybe scratching their head and say, I can't believe that. Look at what those kids are doing to my maybe push them towards uh, this type of activity at home for them, for their family. Yeah, well, we're really excited that we were asked to uh, help with the kids' classes this year. So how many kids out there uh, were in our woodworking class today? Let me hear a big yay. Oh, long. come on, that was a little weak. Let's do it again. How, how many kids were in our class today? Yay. Oh. Okay, well, we had a lot of adults that said they wish they could have taken the kids' classes. Yeah. So we're making spoons and cutting boards, and we've got scroll saw class, and we're making harvest baskets, and we've got extra kits at the booth, too, if anybody else wants to. If you weren't able to get in on the class, you can, you can get a kit at our booth to make it at home. Thank you, Kyle. You've got great neurosurgeons in your family. I appreciate you boys coming up. Thank you. This evening, I get the privilege of introducing our speakers, Robert and Michelle Sullivan. And there's a lot I'd like to say, but I know they have a lot to say too. So um, I'll just say this. We first met them in 2019 in Romania. And you know, when you get farmers together, there's an incredible bond even though we'd never met them before. I had communicated with them by email, but um, there was an immediate bond and they spent hours telling us the highs and lows of their agricultural journey. And they had us alternately in tears and laughing and shaking our heads in wonder. And um, I know that you will experience that tonight um, my only fear is that I don't know how they're going to get it all in an hour. So uh, with that, I'm going to just turn it over to them and let them share with you what God can do when you surrender your will to him.
next to each other? Good evening, everybody. Um, where do we start? Well, first of all, we'll start with uh, <laughs> our names, Robert and Michelle. And um, before we get into um, our journey, um, sharing a short testimony, how God has brought us thus far, we just want to um, say a quick word of prayer again, if you don't mind. Father in heaven, again, we don't know about tomorrow, but we know that today we just have this last chance to give your name glory and honor. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will reside in this room and will minister to each of our hearts. Help us all to remember to recommit to you because you first loved us with an undying love. Be with us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, where do we start? Um, first things first, before we start actually, uh, let me just uh, give you a little update. I think there was a slide actually on the news last evening. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a quick update because um, some of you will know that we were scheduled to be here at Agadagra a couple of years ago. And um, because of visa issues and uh, because of COVID, and uh, we, weren't able to, we weren't able to make it. But it's a testimony that we, testimony of God, <laughs> in his goodness that we stand here today and that um and that we are here being able to bear testimony of how good god is i mean it's too long to even go into that testimony <laughs> but um we suffice will. it to say yeah go on Ron. yeah okay. we, we'll we'll share just a little bit yeah but the reason why we've chosen the title uh God is actually the lord is in his holy temple is because it's a it's something that we often say to each other mm. Usually when something um, ominous seems as if it's going to happen, we usually will look at each other and Robert will say, the Lord is in his holy temple, don't worry, the Lord is doing something, he's up to something, he's in the background. So this is just, it seems to be the theme of our mm. agricultural journey. Mm. And so that's why we chose this particular title today. Yeah, and we pray that it will be an encouragement um, for each one of you. Okay, let's just... Okay. And we're going to have to pray for the technology to work today. Uh, let's see. So just bear with us as we just um, try and get this going. But anyway, suffice it to say. Well, actually, the next slide says 2006, but we can skip that and go to the next slide. So if you could, yeah, if we could just have two slides along. I think they might not be working. I think we may just have to continue talking. Okay. We'll just continue talking. <laughs> so basically, as uh, Robert just mentioned, it's a testimony that we're here because in, I can't remember the year, but it was during the pandemic we were asked to come. And um, I don't know if many of you heard our original testimony. If you didn't, then um, it's actually on Audioverse for that particular year. I don't remember. Maybe somebody might remember what year it was, but it's, it is on Audioverse. But the result of that testimony, um, or the result of the story, is that Robert was actually unable to travel to the U.S. He was, was actually was banned. He was actually classed as inadmissible. Mm -hmm. And so when we had our first invitation to come, we sent a visa application in. But because of the pandemic, the visa office was closed. And then we had the lockdown, and so even if it was open and he did manage to get a visa to come, uh, we wouldn't have been able to come anyway because of the pandemic. And even if they lifted the pandemic, we still couldn't come anyway because of the vaccinations, because we weren't vaccinated. So we had many issues. And so when the um, ban was lifted, we had a noti Robert had a notification from the visa office to say that we still have your application. 
because we'd lodged it, but then it just kind of paused. And then when everything opened back up, they basically contacted him and said, well, we still have your appointment here. But we were like, well, it's too late now. <laughs> ADAG has come and gone. So there's not really much we can do about it. However, his dad was living in um, New Jersey, and his dad was very sick. And he had been sick for a number of years. Mm. And we couldn't come and visit him. The last time we saw him was 2006. Eight. Sorry, 2008. Eight, yeah. 2008. Mm. And um, we were unable to see him. So when they contacted us to tell us, OK, you can now come for your appointment. We've about opened back the offices. Um, we had news that his dad was going to pass away. So we were like, oh, wow, this is just perfect timing. Let's see what the Lord may be able to do. So, so with that, we, we got our appointment, and we went along to that appointment. And that was January 23. Um, he went on the proviso, he went and told them, you know, I'd like to see my father, et cetera, et cetera. And just to give you um, an update or to give some context, previous to that, he had applied and was denied. And so the second time we were like, maybe he'll be denied again, but we'll just try and see anyway. And so you went to the appointment and he had what you had, maybe you can explain you, he had all his paperwork, all his, everything. He'd done his research to find out, you know, what it is that he needed and made sure he had every single piece of paper available. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe you could explain what happened when you got there. Yeah, when I got there, the, the interview was very quick. And this is good to know. I, I was all researched. I was all ready. The interview was quick. And um, the gentleman said, uh, I've already made up my mind. And I had read about this on forums that they are very quick and sometimes just on face value they'll make up your mind and just um, turn you down. And so um, he said, I've already made up my mind. And I said, well, you know, um, I've bought all this paperwork and you haven't looked at any of my paperwork. I've done everything that I need to do. And he said, uh, no, 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 I've already made up my mind. And at this point, I was really, um, I was really perplexed. <laughs> Not frustrated, but actually I felt quite downhearted because I was like, I've come so far and I'm really just trying to see if I can see my father and uh, I've done everything that I can do in terms of paperwork. Uh, but in my mind, I thought, well, if this is a consequence again for my past life, then fine. Okay, we'll have to live with that. And then the, the gentleman said, no, um, I've made up my mind. Um, I'm going to grant you your visa request so that you can go and see your dad. And Initially, when he told me that, I was still in shock because I thought, oh, that was so quick. And again, I even said to him, um, do you need to uh, see my paperwork? Because I was st still in shock. And he said, no, I don't need to see anything at all. I've made a decision, and um, you're able to see your father. So with that, we were like, oh, brilliant. Praise the Lord. And um, sorry. Yeah, so I was like, brilliant, praise the Lord. The Lord has opened up a way so I can go and see my father. Well, what happened was a few weeks, um, a few weeks later, my father passed away. And so I wasn't able to see him. Yeah. yeah, so I wasn't able to see him. So we were kind of wrestling with this. We were like, Lord, what is this about? Um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You need to open it. Sorry, just, let's just... Um, because they came out and they couldn't find it. Just give me one second. Let me just... Um, Okay. <laughs> pray that the technology, technology works. works. Please pray works for out. the technology. So where did you get to? Uh, we were praying afterwards, saying, Lord, what was this all about? Because it was March. It was actually um, 
March that, well, in the January, they said that you have been, that they were going to put him forward for the visa, but they said that it can take uh, about two to three weeks before their request for your passport. And then they said it can take anything up to six months to actually get the visa back. And so what had happened is we were waiting and we were waiting and waiting and they didn't request the visa until, sorry, request your passport until around March time. It was a long time, wasn't it? And what, what had happened is his father, as he said, had passed away. And literally the day after or two days after, because we didn't understand why the Lord would allow, allow. this to happen, but it was two days after or even the day after Adagra sent an invitation to come and speak. Mm. And so we were like, maybe this is not anything to do with that. Maybe this is to do with coming here. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah. Just and so what, what happened in, in the melee is our sometimes, and, and I'm sh we're sharing this for a reason, sometimes our trust in God is dependent on how God answers our prayers. So if we pray for rain and God gives rain, then we say, praise the Lord. But if we pray for rain and instead sun and drought come, what do we do then? Mm. How is our relationship with God? Are we still able to lift his name up in praise through the seeming dark times? Yeah. So we're just going to go through our agricultural journey um, in... 40, about 45 minutes if we can mm -hmm. just going through some of the highlights of what the Lord has done for us mm -hmm. hoping that it would be an encouragement to those that may be thinking about agriculture maybe thinking about getting into farming and wondering whether it's something that they should do or whether it's something that the Lord is calling them to do mm -hmm. so our story really begins back in the city and I think um, some of you may understand that that's where a lot of people start out mm -hmm. And we, we were in the city, and at the time, Robert was studying, um, well, he made a decision whether to study music or whether to study law, and at the time, he decided to study law. And that was obviously a three-year three degree. And as, we were, as, we were doing, as he was doing the law degree, the Lord had shown us, this was around 2008, the benefits of country living. But this was quite late in our sort of life. I mean, our eldest son was already what, 14, 15. Um, and oh, and just to say, just for context, so uh, we have seven children, five of which are here, two are grown. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're away. Left the nest. Yeah. So Without permission. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. So, so basically, it was quite late for us. Yeah. Um, but we did it all the same. We then moved to Scotland in 2008 and whilst we were in Scotland Robert was just finishing up his um, law degree and at the time you know I'm not going to go into that testimony because that would yeah. take too long but there's it literally is just testimonies all the way along but the Lord had opened the way for him to be able to finish his law degree while at home even though the university did not offer um, online or distance learning but they did open that up for him um, as a you know yeah. just to help us along the way. Yeah. So how did we... Huh? Okay. <laughs> so how did we get into agriculture? Well, we didn't at first. Mm. You know, we wanted to devise our own ways and means of making and supporting ourselves whilst and, we're in... And, and I think it's fair to say, because some, some of you, it may resonate with, with you, where maybe um, if you've just moved to the country or you've been in the country for a while, sometimes we get into the rut of we're trying to do what we used to do in the city, in the country. We're, we're still trying to um, look after ourselves. We're still trying to fend for ourselves. And God is there, but he's not the main thing. We're still trying to do our thing. So it's like a change of, um, we would say in the UK, a postcode or a zip postcode code. Postcode change, but so it's like we're still the same people. Still the same people. Still, you know, it's just a different address. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And so we decided that we would start a new business and because, of course, we needed to support ourselves. And that was going to be, at the time, a state agency. And so you can see up there, we had advertised with this particular company, Prime Location. Um, it's one of the top leading um, portals 
We spent money, a lot of money, advertising, but we didn't have one single phone call. Nobody called us. Even so. though we had everything set up for the business to run. And we felt as if, and we've said this many times, we felt as if, even with our endeavors, that the Lord had his hand over the business so that it would not go anywhere. But you must remember that at the time we were still praying for God's will, but we didn't know what God's will was. So really we were praying for God to bless what we were doing instead of finding out what is it that he really wants us to do. Okay. So if, if anybody wants to know a little bit more about that particular story, you can go to YouTube and we've done, we've, there's a little video on there just to save time here. Yeah. So when we realized that we weren't successful and <laughs> <laughs> things were, you know, seemed to be falling apart and we didn't have you know, the money that we really needed um, and things were pretty desperate, yeah. we decided to pray and to go on our knees and find out from the Lord what it is that he wanted. If we can get the next slide, please. I don't think this is, yeah. And so that led us back to the book, Country Living. Now, we were already in the countryside, so, you know, but we went back to Country Living, but now it was to try and find an occupation. Hmm. So we thought, well, the Lord must have some kind of direction for us. You know, he wouldn't bring us out here to, to, for us to die. You know, we, there's, there's got to be something that we can do. So, you know... I kind of felt a little bit like the Egyptians that were taken out into the wilderness. <laughs> you know, he's brought us out here to die, you know, so that we can die. <laughs> you know, and that's how we, that's kind of how I felt, you know. So um, we went back to the book Country Living, but this time with new eyes to try and really, we were in a, a state where we were prepared to hear what it is that the Lord had to say because anything else that we tried just did not work. And so obviously, when you're reading Country Living, there's a whole section about occupation. And all it would say is agriculture, 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 agriculture. And so we were in obviously a rural area within Scotland and all around us was agriculture. So it wasn't a hard thing. So we decided that we would put our hand to the soil. <laughs> we knew nothing, absolutely nothing about yeah. farming but we were fired up when we read quotes like this and you you've if you've read country living you know this but at the time we had read this but just missed it because we weren't looking for occupation we were just trying to get to the country so now we're here this was now what to do us. we do yeah <laughs> if the land is cultivated it will with the blessings of god supply our necessities that got me thinking because i was like well hold on a minute <laughs> We got lots of necessities. Yeah, we need our necessities supplied. Yeah, yeah we, we, we definitely need to be doing that. We should work the soil cheerfully, hopefully, gratefully, believing that the earth holds in her bosom rich stores for the faithful worker to garner, storers richer than gold or silver. That resonated with us. That yeah. really did resonate. We were like, how come we didn't see this before? You know, th this is plain. Do you want to just read the next? Yeah. And then we saw, I mean, there are many quotes, but we're just, you know, for the sake of time, we just picked out these two. In God's plan for Israel, every family had a home on the land with sufficient ground for tilling. Thus were provided both the means and the incentive for a useful, industrious, and self-supporting life. And no devising of men has ever improved upon that plan. To the world's departure from its owing is a large degree the poverty and wretchedness that exists today. And so what always strikes us is, and no devising of men has ever improved upon that plan. So no estate agency will ever improve upon this plan. No lawyer will ever Im improve upon this plan. So we thought we would take these quotes to the bank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and literally do what the Lord is, is asking us to do. Now, on this journey, <laughs> and it's interesting because uh, we were thinking of this video for ages, we couldn't remember the name of it. But actually what happened is a friend of ours showed us this video. Well, no, actually, he gave us a DVD. Urban Danger. Urban mm -hmm. Danger. And, um, and I don't know if you know uh, the other video. Has, has anybody seen home. Urban Danger? A few people. Okay. okay. You see if you can watch it. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, we watched this at the same time, again. Around that time. And mm -hmm. it was very inspiring. And what inspired us, there was a... <laughs> There was an Adventist family, yeah. and they had this farm, and they lived this really romantic-looking life, you know. Yeah. If the With their parents. 
Yeah, I mean, it was just amazing. And it turned out to be Bountiful Blessings Farm. <laughs> so we were like, wow, this is just great. Look at this. And I just sit there and watch this family and the children diving into the whatever it is. The pool. Yeah, and yeah, zip wiring. And yeah. I was just like, wow, yeah. this is just. So we reached out to them. And we were, you know, just asking questions like, I don't even know if we even knew what to ask, but we were just like, you know. But the, the thing is, they encouraged us along the way yeah. and gave us some, you know, some ideas books. of some resources that we should um, read, mm -hmm. Elliot Coleman and, and things like that. And also this other DVD, but this one is not Adventist. It's just of a family that moved into a Mennonite community and... Um, they, or Anabaptists, I'm not sure which one, and they were living there, but I think they might have been Messianic Jews or something. Mm, something. But just again, it just, it just painted a picture of this agrarian life. And I remember the lady sitting there and she's saying, you know, we don't have very much, she said, but we make enough, we, we can grow enough food to support our family. And I was like, wow, that, this is just that's amazing. Nice. That's nice. Yeah. So yeah. that, that really nice. encouraged us along the way. And the children, they were just so sweet. They'd be barefoot and they had, you know, <laughs> and they're just running through the fields. And if anybody's been on our microgreen course, mm -hmm. I was sort of painting this picture of this, you know, romantic scene of our children barefooted, running through the warm grass with butterflies flying around and... It never, you know, obviously we've been farming for a while now and I know it's not quite that way. <laughs> but that was the dream. Well, this, this was our, <laughs> instead of butterflies and uh, dry grass, it's more like um, mud, mud. <laughs> yeah. and a lot of it. Yeah. And so we made a start. Yeah. yeah. We made a start. We didn't quite know everything to do. We, you know, we made tunnels made out of plastic that got blown in the wind. Oh, we, we did so many things that were just crazy, really, when you look back at it. But we were determined. We didn't make much money either in the no, beginning. No. We, we didn't make much money at all. And even in the throes of it all, we even left agriculture at one point, mm. and we went down south. But the Lord then brought us back and brought us back to agriculture again. Yeah. And it was because we had rented a piece, a small piece of land initially from a local farmer, and that was another testimony how we got that land. He didn't charge us a penny for it. But then, unfortunately, he passed away, and then his son said that he required the land back. Mm -hmm. and, and Robert, being feeling a little frustrated, said, you see, this is why we need to have our own land. We just need to go back to what we were doing before, and then we'll have the money, and we can buy our own land, and then we can just grow. Mm -hmm. So that was the, that was the plan. Mm -hmm. So we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed for us all because the Lord did not open the door immediately, mm. but he gave us what we wanted we in the end, pushing. because we kept pushing. Mm. And we weren't, I don't even think you were there that long, probably into the second month, and now we were praying again for the Lord to help us, because we couldn't find a rural property near where he was working, because he was actually working back in London. Mm. We only got as far as two miles outside the Scottish border, the Scottish-English border. We never left Scotland. He didn't allow us to leave Scotland and go into England. And um, we got to the place where we literally said, because with his traveling, he was traveling backwards and forwards and we were staying home. Then he would come back on the weekends. He would come on the Friday, then have to leave on the Sunday. So I'd be elated on the Friday and depressed on the Sunday. It was just a mess. Mm. And in the end, we just had to say, we got on our knees, didn't we? Mm. And we said, we, Lord. We prayed this prayer, which we've done many a time. It was just three words. Three words? Lord, oh yeah, yeah, it is three words. Lord, Lord do, do something. something. <laughs> we had reached the stage where we realized we, did, we don't have the answers. And admittedly, we reached a stage where we realized that we had just made a mistake. And now we need the Lord to Help us. humbly get us out of this situation. But we didn't know what that what, would what be. What that was going to be. What that would look like. But we knew we were on the wrong path. And as we came up from our knees, Robert said something. He says to me often, um, something along the lines I of... I said, take care that take the care. Lord <laughs> will Karen, answer this prayer in the way that we We won't expect. Yeah, and whenever he says expect. that, I shiver. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what does this mean? And within 24 hours, the director called and said, we just did an audit. And we realize now that we didn't have the money that we thought we had. And so we can't actually afford you. Mm. So we have to let you go. And when he said that, I was on the phone with him. When he said that, I think he was expecting me to grovel and ask. And I said, oh, in my mind, I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this is it. 
praise the Lord, we're going back. And so obviously at that time, we now had no job, we had no money, we had no house because we thought we had found a property in the, in the midst of all of this and given up our notice. Then we realized we couldn't afford that property, so we withdrew our notice, but they said, oh, I'm so sorry, but we've actually given your property to someone else. So we were homeless, moneyless, jobless, in the perfect position where the Lord could work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's lots to be said about this. Let me just throw in there, <laughs> and I think this is why uh, when we were speaking um, with the Dice Singers, we, we really kind of resonated, because, uh, and, and afterwards then we read the book, and then we were like, yeah, we know why. Oh, we read their book. Because oh. on this journey, you'll realize, some of you may, may resonate, that God's ways aren't our ways. And what we see as success is not success in God's eyes, you know? God's ways are much higher than our ways. And so we may have times, especially when we're talking about growing, we may have times of seasons of nothing growing, everything going bad, crop failure. And in our eyes and surrounding neighbors will say, oh, well, maybe it's not for you, you know? <laughs> but in God's eyes... Keep going. <laughs> keep going. Keep moving forward. Keep pressing forward. This is all about God. It's not necessarily about the growing per se and about earning per se than actually having a close relationship with God. And so because of that, there's going to be crop failure. There's going to be no rain. There's going to be too much hail. There's going to be too no much job. sun. There's no going to be no, no money. Nowhere to live. There's going to be <laughs> fridge bare. <laughs> Yeah. So that was our situation. We were right in the, in the perfect spot that the God Lord wanted us to be in. Mm. And so we literally had to go on our knees again and say, okay, Lord, what would you have us to do? Mm. And then a friend messaged us, sent us an email. And in that email, um, he sent some properties. One of them was like way off in the island, somewhere north, mm. off of the off of, mainland of the mainland Scotland. We were like, what is he thinking? Mm. We definitely didn't want to go there. And they're, they're, I think there were just three properties. Two of them were just, mm. it was just never going to work. And we had been looking, and we just could not find anything if we were going to go back into Scotland, like further north. Um, but, he, but there was just one property that he sent to us. And I called up the lady, and we, obviously we had prayed. And she just kept using these words like, it's, it's, it would be, it would be worth, worth your while. while to come and take a look at it. And it was going to be like a five-hour trip and all of this. And we had to think about all of this. She said, it will be worth your while. Long story short, without a job and without a um, reference. reference from, you know, we, we, didn't, have we anything didn't have anything to qualify for this property. Mm -hmm. And so when we went there. And we had prayed. Yeah, it, it's, it's good to note this. We had prayed. And when we saw the property, we were like, oh, well, this is really good. But then the reality, I don't have a job. <laughs> We don't have a bank reference. We don't have a work reference. I don't have anything. This is really wishful thinking. But we were like, Lord, if this is for us, you're going to have to make a way. That's I can't right. lie. I can't try and mm, maneuver Wangle my way something. through this. Yeah. It is what it is. And so when we were with the, the, the landlord, we said to her, um, what, what is it that you what, need? What do you what, need? What do you, do you need, need from references, us? References, employment reference, bank reference. Well, I was just waiting for it to land. And then she said, um, no. Uh, we go by how you look, and we, we really like you people. <laughs> so <laughs> we'd, we'd really love to have a family in this yeah. house, she said. It would be really nice because there was this other family, not family, it was a guy, who wanted and he rent wanted rent. to use the house as storage or something. Mm. Mm. And she said, we were not really keen on that. We'd like to have a family here, and we really like you guys. But there was another family that mm. they needed to see because they had already arranged it. So she said, let us just see that family first because we've already made the arrangement. Mm. And then we will let you know tomorrow. So we went home, we got on our knees and we prayed. We said, well, Lord, if this is your will, mm. open the way. And if it's not, close the way. Yeah. And so the next morning we had the phone call and she said, yeah, the other family, we don't really want them, we want you. Mm. So we were like, oh, praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we had a house to live in. Mm. <laughs> and so we managed to scrummage together all the deposit because she needed a deposit. So we managed to scrummage that together and the first month's rent and we were away. And then whilst we were there at this property, we had the idea that Robert was going to go back to London because we don't learn. Mm. Okay, we're just like the Israelites. Mm. And he was going to go and do contract work. But we had sweetened it with the fact that we were only 
20, 30 minutes from the airport, so we thought, well, you could just fly, and it won't be so much driving, and we'll see you more often. And that was the plan. That was how we were going to afford our way. But something just did not feel right about that. I don't know what it was. I just had this angst within me. And I said to him, because he was about to start looking, and I said, you know what? Let's pray about it first, because that's a really good way to store things. <laughs> and I said, let's pray. In fact, we did. We did pray about it. We did. And we felt, I just said to him, I said, I just think we need to listen to something about agriculture. Mm. I don't know what, but let's just, because, you know, we put the children to bed and we have a couple of hours to spare. Let's listen to something. So we went to Audioverse. When we went to Audioverse, we listened to a whole series mm. um, from Adagra. I think it was from like the previous year or something. This might yeah. have been somewhere around 2016. Yeah. So it might have been 2015, probably, 2016. Yeah, something like that, or maybe even from that year. And by the time we'd finished this series, we were sold. Mm. It was the first time we'd even heard mm. anybody talk about Some the, the, financials, the financials, because we often find that people are very closed about you know, what you can earn and things like that. But people were just open. And we were just like, we were just like, wow, I mean, we could do, we could really do this. But then we realized that we, well, we didn't think that we had any land. But it turns out that the property that God had brought us to had a one acre paddock. It was actually set on three acres, which we just thought was sort of like, I don't know, sloping garden. garden. Hmm. But then the landlord said, no, it's the paddock across the way as well. That was a whole acre. And so we asked the landlord, in fact, we prayed. It was a fleece. Yes. We said again, okay, Lord, um, if this is definitely for us, well, you need to make a way. Because the landlord can easily say, well, yes, it's a paddock, but I don't want it to be used for anything else. I don't want it to be dug up. We just want it nice and flat. And I said, well, we will take that, but maybe not at this property. Yeah. So when we called, they were actually trying to sell the idea to us. Mm. We were like, oh. This is strange. She said, this would be really good mm. because, you know, there was this other family that lived somewhere in the district and they did really well, mm. you know, growing vegetables and things. She said, this would be such a great idea. And she was literally selling it to me. Mm. So we were like, wow, okay. Praise we came off the phone the and we were like, there we go. We have it in confirmation now. And so we began our, our gardening journey. There are so many testimonies along the way, and we've shared some of them in the microgreen, um, in the microgreen, well, in some of the classes that we've taught. But, you know, we've had times literally where we hadn't even had the money mm -hmm. to have the field, oh, the oh, slide's sorry. not there, it's fine. The field that we have, we didn't even have the money to have it plowed and flailed. And so we were explaining that one year, we had asked the contract farmer, because we did have the money at the time when we asked him, mm. we asked the contract farmer to come in and flail and plow and power harrow the field for us. And it was gonna cost something like 200 and something pounds. pounds. Mm -hmm. And so, but it'd been raining and raining and raining and raining this particular season. And he'd started off whilst it was dry, doing all of the big fields for the big farmers, you know, the 100 acres and 50 acres and things, and left ours until a bit later on. Um, but then the rains came, and now he couldn't get in with the tractor because it would just be too wet, so he just didn't come. Mm. And so week after week after week was passing, and we didn't hear anything. And by now, we had other bills to pay, so we used that money, and we paid other bills. And, and we were like, you know, obviously, it's not going to work, so we'll have to just let this guy know that not, we can't... Not to bother. That not to bother coming because we can't afford to pay him. And we, um, we prayed about it. We made the decision, we're going to call him, and we're going to let him know. But not too long after we came off our knees, he was coming up the track. Mm. We heard his tractor rumbling up the track, and we were like, oh, no. What are we going to do now? And he came, and he was like, hi, guys, you know, where's the field? And we were like, oh, it's over there. <laughs> so he carried on, and he um, started the work. And we came back in the house. We literally just got on our knees. Lord, what would you have us to do now? Mm. And then the post came. Mm. And when the post came, I had this envelope. And in the envelope was a check. And the check was from our bank. 
and the bank had said that they had overcharged me for something. Now the figure on that check was the amount that we needed to pay the tractor plus tithe. <laughs> so that was further confirmation for us that the Lord really did want us to farm. And so that's what we did. We, we started to do some veg boxes. We grew kale and some collard greens and radish. tomatoes and radish, and we were on our way. And as we were going through, it's like I'm doing all the talking. No, go ahead. As go we ahead. were going through, um, oh yeah, as we were going through, we, Robert came in one sweaty, sunny day. I was sitting in the bedroom doing something, and he came and sat on the floor. He's leaning against the wall, and he said, Mish, he says, um, have you ever asked the Lord recently to bless our farm? And I was like, no, <laughs> not really. And he said, I really feel impressed that we should ask the Lord to bless our farm. I was like, okay. So we got on our knees and we asked the Lord to bless our farm. And it's not, it's not as if uh, we hadn't prayed that prayer before, but it's just that there was a period where, you know, you go through the motions, you're just doing, 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 doing. It was suddenly, I just suddenly had this thought, must have been the Holy Spirit, that mm, you haven't connected in in that way. Remember, this isn't your farm, this isn't your work, it's God's. And my so and there's an order. Family. So I was like, ah, oh, oh yeah, of course. So it's really for him to bless his business. It's his yeah. farm. So we wanted him to be connected with it. Mm. And so that's what we did. We prayed. And not too long and, after. And, sorry, and the prayer was literally, Lord, bless the farm. That was it. Not anything specific, just Lord, bless the farm. And so not too long after that, a matter of days, uh, Robert, we were sitting at the table having lunch and his phone rang and he didn't answer. So I said, oh, aren't you going to answer your phone? He said, no, I'm eating, you know, we'll just leave it. And this happened three days, two or three days in a row, wasn't it? And then one quiet afternoon, he decided to go check his messages and um, found that he had missed two or three calls from the BBC. And they had left messages to say that they wanted to come and film our farm <laughs> for a program. It was a um, escape to the country. It was escape to the country. It's just well, we can go forward and then back. Oh yeah, we can go forward and back. Yeah, it was a, it was escape to the country. And uh, but they said that because we hadn't got back to them, they decided that they were going to film somebody else. So we were like, oh. Okay, and we were feeling very disheartened. Well, I, I was feeling really gutted because it was just <laughs> my laziness, really. Um, and after we spoke about it a bit, I was, I don't know, I felt, yeah, quite bad. You, know? you must have felt bad. I didn't yeah. make him feel bad. I didn't say a thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I just did, left I, it. I, I the Holy Spirit is much better at speaking to people than me. <laughs> so I remember speaking to the Lord and, and I was like, oh, Lord. I am really, really sorry, but I realize uh, there's nothing I can do at this point. And um, we said, but if your name can be glorified, then please do something. If this BBC calling and leaving messages and talk about filming, if this is some trivial thing, not really connected with you or anything, then don't worry, I'll just take the hit, not a problem. But if your name can be glorified, then please do something. And, and, um, and so with that, we decided to pray. We got on our knees and the children, because they obviously knew all about it, we got on our knees and we prayed. We were like, come on, children, we need to pray. And we need to pray this prayer. Well, this quote, <laughs> this promise. <laughs> yeah, so when we prayed, we prayed Proverbs 21, 1, back to the, Lord. the king of kings, which says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. So that ultimately means... It's up, to, it's up to the it's Lord. Up to the Lord. Yeah, he is in control. Lord. And if something is to go left, if he allows it, it's his will. But if he wants it to go right, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> God is in total control. So we claim this promise, and not in an arrogant way, but I was claiming it as in, if your name can be glorified, then Lord, please turn that river. Okay, so we had a phone call the next morning and it was the executive producer, and he said, well, I spoke with the producer, and he said that... And bearing in mind <laughs> that 
they already said on the message, that's it, you've missed it. There's no, we're sorry, we've we moved that, on to somebody else. Yeah, a piece of, piece of information is that we did call and they said, we're really sorry. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. But they did call us back the next day. And the, after we had prayed. After we had prayed this prayer. And the executive producer said, actually, the producer wants to film you guys. So can we do it? We were like, yes. Praise you know, the Lord. Absolutely. And so they came out and they filmed Escape to the Country, which is quite, it's quite an ironic title, isn't it? <laughs> but it's a, it's a very um, popular program. I don't know if you have it here, but apparently it gets aired in Australia and across Europe and here in the US, but maybe you don't watch TV, so... We don't either, but we know Escape to the Country because it's... It's um, been going for years. It's been going for absolutely years, yeah. And so here is the film crew out uh, filming the farm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and just before, we, uh, just before we, we go forward on that, it was an interesting time because doing farming, it brings immense evangelism opportunities. And so because... These people were here, and, then, and we're going to um, just explain a little bit more what happened after that. Everyone's asking the same questions. Why what, are you here? Yeah. Like Why you, are you in the country? You don't even have a Scottish accent. <laughs> yeah. We're like, because we're not from Scotland, we're yeah. from down south, you know, from what, southeast of yeah. England. Um, what, what brings you to Scotland? Yeah. You know? And why farm? Well, you know, there's this book by Ellen White, and it's called Country Living. And, you know, in the Bible, you know, many of the patriarchs and prophets, you know, they were all involved in agriculture. And so that's what we decided to do. And we would just give them the whole, you know, the whole backstory. Yeah. yeah. And even, oh, if you could, if we could go back a slide, I don't know. Sonali Shah, she was the presenter. sort of presenter. And she came up with this wonderful quote. She said, so you homeschool your children as well? We were like, yeah. She said, so this is like a kind of farm school. And I was like, yeah, that's a really lovely quote. I like that. <laughs> so they kind of got, got the idea. So we carried on mm -hmm. doing our little veg boxes. And, um, you know, we got to a place in, in our walk where we weren't really making very much money at all. And uh, one day I was sitting in the living room and I felt strongly impressed by the Lord to rejig or go over our budget. And so that's what I did. I sat down. In, in fact, I tried to ignore it a couple of times, but like, it was quite heavy on my heart to go over the budget. So I went over the budget. And this is at the end of the season now. We've come to the end of our first official growing season in this uh, property. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't have enough to make ends meet. In fact, we were down by about 400, 400. pounds a month. And so I said, Robert came in and he said, oh, what's, what's, you know, is this something I should be involved in? I was like, yeah, uh, we are down by 400 pounds a month. And it's the end of the season. It's not like we can even grow anything now. What, what do we do now? And he was like, well, we just have to go on our knees. And, you know, ask the Lord what it is that we, we should do now. And so to make a long story short, we did that. We had a message that popped up on our phone whilst we were praying, actually. And when we looked, we saw this guy and he was asking Robert about some microgreens that you were growing in the tunnel, wasn't That's it? Right. That's right. And he was just like, oh, how did you, how did you grow that? And they were just talking. And Robert asked me, oh, did you, did you have any sense, any impression from the Lord? of anything, any answer to our prayer? And I was like, no, <laughs> not, not anything really. And I said, you? And he was like, no. And so we just carried about our day. And then I was going in the shower and he, and he later, hours later, and he said the same thing. Do you have any impressions from the Lord? Like what it is that you think he wants us to do? And I was like, no. Um, you? And he's like, no. And then just as I went in the shower, I kind of sensed the Lord say, what do you mean, no? What about the message that you had earlier? And I was like, oh, yeah, a message about microgreens. Like, and then it hit me. I was like, maybe the Lord wants us to do microgreens. And so I called out to Robert and I said, I think maybe the Lord might want us to do microgreens. And then he says to me, because he was in the bedroom, and he said, yeah, I just had a message from this guy asking us at that moment, just asked us, do you sell microgreens? We were like, wow, this is something. So we got really excited about it, and we called up, um, we decided 
you know, because we were just talking amongst ourselves about the potential of selling masses and masses of microgreens. <laughs> and uh, we decided to call up a wholesaler to see, is this even a thing? Like, do people even buy microgreens? We know people in the US make microgreens, but that's not to say that we can. And so we quickly went on Instagram. We were looking at restaurants locally and in Edinburgh, and we were sc like scrolling into the picture to see the plates. And, and we were like, yes, there's microgreens. We can see them. They're there on the plates. So then we decided that we would call a wholesaler. A wholesaler. That was Robert's idea. Mm. He was like, we should call a wholesaler just to find out if they even sell them. Do they buy them? Do they sell them? And if they sell them, I wonder how, ma how many you know, tubs they sell. Let's just find out. Let's do our research. So we called up. So we decided, <laughs> it was quite funny because we were like, should we stay up until midnight? Because this particular uh, company, they opened midnight. Well, it's like a, a fish market type of thing. And they also do you know, fruit and veg, and they supply the suppliers. And so we were like, maybe we should stay up until midnight. And then we were like, no, let's not you know, damage our health just to sort this out. You know, we'll call them early in the morning. So we did. We woke up, we called them. And the guy said, come down. He said, oh, if you're a grower, he said, why don't you come and have a meet with us? So we did. We went and met with him. Do you want to? Yeah, we, we met with him. And um, literally, and this is not even exaggerating, we met with him for just a couple of minutes. 15 minutes, maybe? At tops. We were taken around the whole place, and then we were taken up to his office. It, it, he it, showed us around, showed us where we keep things. It's all wholesale stuff. Yeah, yeah. it felt like we were actually swirled around. Swirled around, yeah. And then we were taken then, up to the office, and then at the office, he brought out some spreadsheets, and uh, there was lots of uh, the microgreens that, uh, that he bought. There was pages upon pages. And then um, he said... Um, can you supply any of these? And we said, well, yeah, um, yeah, we, we could probably this, this, this. And he said, okay, well, you know, pick a couple. And um, so we picked about four or five uh, line items. And um, then we got whisked out. Yeah, just like that. And we didn't know what we got whisked out with. <laughs> We just agreed to some things, but we didn't really know what it was that we agreed to. So we decided to drive to a car park and sit down. We were kind of scratching our head, looking at each other like, what happened there? <laughs> and when we had calculated everything, we realized that the Lord had answered our prayer. We'd walked away with a deal of 2,000 pounds worth of money, not weight, <laughs> 2,000 pounds worth of microgreen sales per month. Yeah. That's yeah. what he'd asked us to supply him. Even though we were down by 400 pounds if you remember yeah. because that's why we went to the Lord in the first place but the Lord gave much more than we actually and we even needed. really needed that's yeah, right yeah praise the Lord and oh. yeah yeah that's another so the question was <laughs> did we grow that much we only had one little strip of table and a couple of uh, trays but if I can make this really short the Lord provided we worked out that we needed 6,000 pounds worth of infrastructure to scale up to, the, to be able to supply that. And we didn't have the money, but the Lord put on our heart to call somebody. And that somebody gave us 3,000 pounds and loaned us 3,000 pounds. And that was all within about a week. Yeah. All this happened within a days. week. And so we purchased everything we needed and we started to supply the wholesale company. And then we went on to the chefs and the restaurants and it went from word of mouth, we didn't do any advertising and we ended up supplying Prince, what, King, King Charles. Charles's restaurant, um, Trump in Aberdeen, his golf course, the head chefs, they, they, because we happened to have supplied it to one guy who happened to be a top chef in Scotland and he told all of his other top chefs and it just spread like wildfire. Mm. Yeah. So that, then we, um, Robert, he has this thing about praying for the Lord to bless the farm and he said <laughs> it again. He's like, oh, don't you think we should pray for the Lord to bless the farm again? I'm like, yeah, I suppose we could. <laughs> and so we did and we, we prayed and we had a phone call it was an email. It, sorry, it wasn't a phone call. It was a, um, a, a, a message on um, our social media. Instagram. 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 Now, obviously, we don't listen to these people's music. We don't know, it, you know. But we had this strange message that said, oh, uh, it was around the time of um, Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter, Matter Matters or something. 
And we weren't really following that, to be quite honest with you, because we were so busy in the farm. We didn't have time to get caught up in political things. But we did get this message, and uh, Robert was very blasé about it. He was like, oh, it's probably a scam. You deal with it, Mish. So I was like, okay. So I thought, well, let me just message these people back. And I messaged them back. And then they messaged me back. So I messaged them back. And before long, they were like, we want to come and film you guys because he's doing this video about black entrepreneurs. And they would like to um, feature your farm. <laughs> we were like, a farm? <laughs> like, how does that even connect? <laughs> and then we were like, oh, but what about the music? And so initially, we were like, Maybe not. no, I don't, I don't think it fits with, you know, what you know, what, what it is that we stand for and, and all of this stuff. But then we remembered that we must pray always before we make our own decisions. So we went on our knees and we prayed, Lord, what would you have us to do? And the, the thought that we had that came back to us was, is the BBC a Christian operation? And we were like, no. They're just as much in the world as these people. And we were like, hmm, that's true. And so we said, okay, we'll... we'll We'll try. We'll, let's see how it goes. We just felt impressed. Let's just, let's just go with it and see what happens. And so anyway, the video came out, the song, whatever it is, came out. And we watched the video with the volume down. <laughs> we watched the video and we were like, oh, they didn't even use it in the end yeah, anyway. It, we didn't feature. So we were like, oh, never mind. And then the credits came. And then we saw our farm and our tractor and we were like, oh, oh. <laughs> they, they did use it. It's there, you know. And we didn't think anything of it. We just carried on our life and we got in the car actually, we turned everything off, got in the car, went to go shopping at Costco and then the phone started to ring. And we were like, what is this? And it was the Press and Journal, which is a newspaper from Scotland. Do you guys, what, do you know what you've just done? You've just put you know, agriculture for Aberdeenshire on the map. We were like, really? Did we? How? Did, how? <laughs> what did we do? They said, yeah, you know, because this is big. We were like, really? And they were like, yeah, we need to have an interview with you. And, and then, the, and then the phone rang again, and it was the BBC, and then it was the Good Morning Show, and then it was this and that, and, and it just went all over the place. You can do the next slide as well. And we were just like, what is this? Like, this is just, we didn't... Now, it... <laughs> the funny thing is, though, and this is the part that we need to share, and we should have actually had the, the picture on here. Each time we were interviewed by the press, and this is what I was saying, everybody would, would ask the same thing. So, what's the story here? Why are you guys in Scotland, and why are you farming? And literally, I'm not exaggerating, we we're everyone. giving you a cut-down version of a testimony. We would share our testimony in full. Amen. That's right. In full. Amen. What is everything. this book, Energy Quotes, Why, Country, country the whole Living, night. the we're whole like, well, <laughs> seen as you've asked. <laughs> we can't lie. <laughs> That's right. And so, obviously, some but newspapers... Yeah. People were really intrigued. They were very fascinated. They were really, really intrigued. And, yeah, I know you were going to say, some, the majority of the newspapers, they didn't really feature Everything. anything to do with our, our testimony because it doesn't really fit with the readers. But there were a couple, I think it was like the Times, which we were, quite we were really impressed. surprised. The Telegraph, um, they which is... They listed out, you know, Ellen White, Country Living. Yeah, da, 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 they listed book, everything, everything. The Seventh-day Adventist said. Church. This was, the, this was the Telegraph, and that's like a broadsheet for us in the UK. Yeah. And it was just amazing. They literally put everything verbatim. We couldn't believe it. Yeah. We were like, wow, this is just amazing, you know? And so then, oh, yeah. we can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. And then we had a phone call from the Mutt Boot Company. They said, you guys would be really good, um, what, is, what do they call it? Brand Whatever. ambassadors. We were like, really? <laughs> and then they said, pick any pair of muck boots that you want. And so we were like, okay. So it was just, it was just crazy. And so be careful. If you ask the Lord to bless your farm, be careful where he might take your farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, I mean, we joke about this now, but literally it's like, because obviously, you know, these things are, they're fun, but we were literally giving God all the glory. Absolutely. That's, yeah. all, we, that's, all, that's all it was about. Because I, I think a couple of times, some people were sort of the um, newspaper reporters. They were sort of looking for another story. Or yeah. Maybe it's. And we were like, no. There is no, no other no. story. This it, is the it's story. It's all God. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's all God. You know. So it was. It was a. It was an amazing experience. So then we just got back to business again, and we had the pandemic, and all the restaurants and chefs, they all 
well, all the restaurants closed down, so we had nowhere to sell the microgreens. So again, we were like, Lord, what would you have us to do? And we were back now with veg boxes. And we got to the place because <laughs> it's quite interesting because at the time, our prime minister was Boris Johnson. And I'll never forget the day he sat there on the TV and he said, nobody can go out and all of this. And he said, you must order your food online. We got to the point where we were doing 250 Delib veg boxes a week yeah. over the pandemic. <laughs> And we were allowed to work. Imagine that. So when things get tough, which we're told they're going to get tough, agriculture is usually one of the last things to be affected. Yeah. You see, and, and so the, we were allowed to continue. There's a testimony there, and again, we've only got like two minutes. <laughs> oh. but, but real quick, because what happened was, because we were doing microgreens, all of our trade, if you imagine during COVID, all of the restaurants and, and hotels, everything just closed overnight. So our earning went from earning to zero literally overnight. So we took it to the Lord, we prayed, we said, well, Lord, what would you have us to do? And um, we thought to ourselves, well, you actually thought, well, maybe we could try something on the veg box. But at the time, I wasn't really thinking that might be, uh, that might be a winner. But well, again, yeah. we prayed again. And um, we already had a website set up and we already had a shop set up, but it was just kind of in the background because we were focusing so much on microgreens. But the, the moment that we opened up the shop, we turned it live. It was like popcorn. It was like the sales company was like boop, 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 constantly. And we just we were like, what is this? You know, but God came through once again. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to have to really race through. Mm -hmm. We had a situation where. You can't go into <laughs> I'm going to just say this very briefly. We had um, the enemy was obviously not very impressed. Mm. And so he had driven the neighbor to drive us out to the point where we couldn't even take water into our field. We couldn't do anything in our field at all um, because she would come down like this. And it just got, I don't like conflict like that. And I just got to the point when I said to Robert, you know what, I don't even want to go out there anymore. Mm. You know, our son Caleb, he didn't, he didn't mind. You know, young guys, he's like, I'll go out there, mommy. And he just went out there with the water and he's just watering, you know. She came <laughs> down and it was just a big hullabaloo. Oh, no, it, I just don't like things like that. And so we decided that we were going to move. And so with the money that we'd saved through the veg boxes of the pandemic, we said we were going to move to Romania because we have friends there and it's cheap there and we can buy a house and land and all our troubles will be over. But the Lord did not open a way for us to be in Romania. We tried we everything tried. in the we book. Tried. And we had time scales. If we have this by this time, we could get out there by this time and then we could start growing by this time. All of those times had come and gone and we were in January at the beginning really of the season grow season that's right in, in terms of for the uk anyway, ordering seeds we would be ordering seeds so we said to the lord lord we you can't know, order seeds we've got we've got nowhere, nowhere to plant to them we can't put them in the field because the lady she's going to come down and do something to us so we said to the lord lord you're going to need to help us if you want us to farm you're going to have to move us or something yeah because we can't stay here and farm clearly look she's not allowing us to do it and so we prayed and we prayed and one day, in fact, it was around the time that we had a, a testimony aired here, we had um, an email that came through from the, um, if we can go to the next slide, the um, uh, chief executive officer for the McDonald uh, Hotel and Resort. And long, cutting a long story short, they said that they'd seen us online and stuff like that, and that they were looking to start a farm, either to have somebody to come and consult with them or better still, to come and bring a farm to their property. And we were like, really? And they said, yeah, how about it type of thing. And we were like, wow, because we've just been praying for land and somewhere to move to. And so she said, well, Mr. McDonald, he's the owner. He has, I don't know how many, 40 hotels. Yeah, he's the, the largest UK. privately owned hotel um, owner in the UK. So she said, let's have a meeting with Mr. McDonald. We met with him. He said, go down the road to Pitodri, which is about 10 minutes from where we lived. He said, ask for the, gate, for the groundsman to show you the land. We have 2,500 acres. Go and pick what you want. So we were like, really? We couldn't believe it. It was like, I think I was numb for like a week. It, it was <laughs> surreal. It, it was, was really surreal. surreal. And he said, you know what? He said, um, we have some cottages on site as well. So you could choose out one of the cottages 
And we were like, really? And he said, we said, and, and what would the rent be? He said, nothing. He said, we don't need anything. We we're like, really? You know, we just couldn't believe, we just couldn't believe what, what we were seeing. Absolutely. And then yeah. it, it turns All out, gone. it turns out that he is a Christian. And he actually said to us, because we met with him a couple of times, um, and he said to us, you know what? He said, I am a steward of God's land. And he said, and I want to put it to good use. So he said, I'd love for you guys to come and be on our land. Yeah, yeah. And so we're just going to show very quickly this. Now, now, just to say, he had 2,500 acres at this property. We didn't choose 2,500. No, we're not greedy. <laughs> we chose 10 acres. I mean, we didn't actually know it was 10 acres. Uh, where the cottage was um, that we chose, when you come out of the door, there is a field. And that field, and we were like, oh, this field would be really good. When we measured it on Google Maps, it was um, 10 acres. That's right. Um, so that's what we chose. And we, we saw the cottage first, and my first prayer was, Lord, please, I don't want neighbors. After what we had just been through, we didn't want neighbors again. I mean, she was involving social services and the police and Scottish Environment Protection Agency, all sorts of things. And I just thought, I don't want, I don't want this again. And the house was on its own. So we saw the house, then we turned around and we saw the field. We were like, wow, we could just walk out of the house into the field. Straight into the field. And so this is, this is it. This is the little track. The hotel is to the right. They have a big, big hotel. This is the track that leads down. And then the house is going to be on the right. And then the field would be just, just beyond. But we thought we would just show you this quick video. Just to say as well, there were, yeah, you did mention there were two properties. The first one we saw, did you just say that? Yeah, the first property wasn't really livable, but yeah. this, this one was. And it was tiny. You know, we had to make a sacrifice because we went from like a six bed property to a, what we call two up, two down. I don't two know rooms if you can... upstairs, two rooms downstairs. That's where we're living. That's right. So but it's God's will. So A friend of ours who understands our journey said, oh, well, it's like a little shepherd's hut. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, we're going to just live in a shepherd's hut. But sometimes we have to make sacrifices. We can't always want and have, what we you want. Know, have our cake and eat it. Sometimes we make sacrifices. We yield to God's plan in the hope for what's well, delayed gratification, isn't it? And so this is the little cottage that we stay in. I don't know if, I think you turn think the camera, don't you? Turn the camera, Which is to the right. The you can see there just through the trees. It's very quaint. And small. That's actually the back. The front door is around the other side. It's very backwards. It's like, mm. yeah. And so... Yeah, actually, we're just, we're just seeing those other fields. Because when we said to uh, Mr. Oh, McDonald yeah. that um, we've picked and it's about 10 acres, I remember he said, is that is all? That, is that enough? Don't you want more? And the way he said it, he said, you should, you should always go with gross, not net. We were like, oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> but 10 is fine. It's 10 times what we have now. Yeah. And all we have is like, at that time, we just had one, one tunnel. One tunnel, yeah. And so that's the entrance into the field. That's the hill, Benahi. We lived over the other side of the hill. And you would be happy to know uh, John Dysinger. I don't know if you remember, we had a conversation in Romania about winter growing. And we said we were on the wrong side of the hill. And we said, oh, we're going to have to move. Well, the Lord put us on the other side of the hill. So that's where we are now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with full sun. So we go to the next slide very quickly. Because yeah. this is... It's only like two or three slides now. A couple more slides and then we're done. So, oh. oh just move on. See yeah. if we can move on. So here yeah. we are signing a lease. Um, Mr. McDonald gave us uh, five years on the property, and this is the library that they're in. If we can get the next, next slide, this is us going in for the first time. Um, and then the next slide, you'll be interested to see that this building, that they, the, the actual hotel is like from the 1800s, I believe. And in their Desi library room. Desire of Ages was on their shelf. Yeah. yeah. We spotted it. Praise the Lord. And we said to them, That's among do you know this book? Of books. You need to read this book. This, this book, this is our book. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Just sign on the dotted line. Now, if you, didn't yeah, if you didn't think that was enough, the Lord was still orchestrating more. Because let me just say, because when we got to the 10 acres, we were like, well, praise the Lord. Now we're here. But then the reality struck. Well, we were on one acre, and we barely had enough infrastructure for that. Now we're on 10 acres, but we've only got infrastructure for one acre. Lord? What would you have us do now? 
You're going to have to do something. You're going to have again. to do something for us because you know. But we're more than happy to just start with the one tunnel and then just get another tunnel and then another one and just slowly grow. Yeah. But the Lord had bigger plans than that. So we had about a month after we had the the phone call from the chief executive officer from the McDonald Hotels. We were in Costco again. <laughs> Seems to be our favorite place. And we had another phone call. But because I had so many. Um, terribly awful phone calls that the neighbor had set up, you know, police and this and that about things that weren't even anything. Um, I thought it was, this was another phone call, so I just gave it to Robert, and I was like, oh, not another one. I was like, Robert, you take this. And he happened just to be there in the corner of Costco whilst I went around shopping for a good 20 minutes talking to somebody, came off the phone, and it was a chef director for a company called Compass Group. And they said that they had seen us again online and wanted to have a chat with us about supplying them. They said that they would like to have a farm that is like a farm to fork type of scenario where they could rely more on local produce rather than it coming from the Netherlands and things like that. And they wanted to have more control over the supply chain and, and things like that. And so we... Um, we agreed to meet with him, in, and by that time we had our one little homemade tunnel in the middle of the 10-acre field. So we allowed him to come. We sat inside that tunnel, and we had this little meeting with him, and he said, so what are your dreams? What's your dreams, and what's your vision? He said, what's your vision? He said, is it to have, like, tunnels going all the way along here? And we were like, well, yeah. I mean, I suppose that would be nice. Um, but, you know, we're... You know, we're not trying to be millionaires. We're not trying to buy a Ferrari, we said to him. We just want to buy our own home. We just want to live in the countryside. We just want a farm. He said, you wouldn't think of far selling the farm to us? We were like, no, because if we sold it to you, then how are we farming? <laughs> so, no, we, we wouldn't want to sell it to you. And he said, well, he said, we would like to work with you. We would like to have you farm for Compass. And so what we'll do is we will give you a certain amount of money to buy the infrastructure that you need to make it happen. And then you can pay us back in veg in any way you want. So you may want to give us half like with each delivery or you may just want to not pay us anything for the first year. There's no interest, no time. If you decide you want to walk away, it's totally up to you. And we were like, really? <laughs> Again? And he said, yeah, he says, you know, it's, it's just that, and he sold his pitch, you know, we really need to have a farm because it will help our sales pitch, so to speak, when they go into the oil rigs because it was to supply their offshore, um, how do you explain it? Uh, yeah, it is like, like the energy. oil rigs, and they, they did all the catering for the oil rigs and for the energy and for the police and for the government and for, we should have put the picture on here, actually, as we were coming through Aberdeen Airport, we happened to see a picture of ourselves. <laughs> it was quite funny. There was this big stand, and it was the artisan grower supplies Aberdeen Airport, the executive lounge. We were like, well, it'd be nice if we could go in there. <laughs> but, but, the, but they food's had there, we're the not. food was there, but we couldn't go in there. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was there. So they gave us 36,000 pounds to buy tunnels and infrastructure, and in return, we supply them with vegetables. And that's what we've been doing, and that's where we're at at this point in time. If we can go to the next slide. So this is them. That's actually Graham. He's the one that met with us right there in the middle. And we'll go to the next slide. They did some little filming with us because what they do is they make a video, and then when they go out to a client, they say, and we have a local grower, and their name is the artisan grower. And they, they grow veganically, and, and it just helps. Apparently, we've been told that it's increased their sales. Mm. So they benefit, and we benefit. Mm. So everything that we grow, and anything that we grow, they take everything. So the more we grow, the more we get. The less we grow, the less the we less get. The less we get, literally. And then we'll go to the next slide. And so this is some of the tunnels that we bought and we were putting up and the next slide mm -hmm. is just more and more if you can go to the next one and these are just yeah and so that's and that's literally as i said that that's what we're doing 
And it's, yeah, that's Caleb. He runs our tractor. And you know, it's quite interesting because one of the neighbor, the, the neighbor that I spoke about, she said, oh, and they have a son and he drives the tractor. She called up the social services. He drives a tractor and it's dangerous, you know. And so the social services called us and said, we've heard from the neighbor that your son drives the tractor. And we were like, yes. And I said, isn't that kind of normal? And she said, yes. She said, it is. She said, in fact, she said, I grew up in a farming district and it's very normal for young people to be driving a tractor. But since your neighbor has mentioned it, we have a duty of care. So he can't be on the tractor until he's 13. And at the time he was like, 12, I think he was like two weeks away from his 13th birthday. And so he had to stay off for like two weeks. And then they also said he had to do training. He had to do training. And we were like, does everybody tra do training? They were like, no, but they have called about you. So you have to, so he has a tractor license. So what, <laughs> 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 yeah. so him Praise and his dad Lord. did the tractor license course. And now he's a qualified, legit tractor driver. <laughs> so next, uh, and so obviously we try and get the whole family involved. But you know, we started farming quite late in, in the children's lives, except for obviously Izzy, she benefits a lot, but the all, others are quite older. So, you know, trying to get them on board. And there's three of the tunnels that they provided for us. And the next one is just some produce that we supply. And actually it was the money that we earned from supplying this catering company that brought us here today. Yeah. And our children helped us to harvest it. We would tell them, we have to make this amount of money, so you need to stay out and harvest with daddy, otherwise we're not gonna make the money that we need. So it's very real. It's very real. Go on to the next slide. And so we've, we've shared with you all of these things, and we've shared with you how God has been helping us and brought us along this agriculture journey, but we're now at a place where we're saying to the Lord, you know what, Lord, you've done amazing things. Before sometimes we even come off our knees in prayer, God you've answered. <laughs> but what about our children? You know, we need, you know, we, we often would not joke in a bad way, but we would say, you know, one day we may have money that the farm has produced and, and we may buy that house and have no children to put in it. And so now we feel strongly impressed at this point in time that um, the Lord wants us to, to do the things that we didn't understand in previous years mm. and to try and bind our children to us. And that's why we've put that quote because that's where we're at right now. We're in that position, in that place. Yeah, yeah. because so, like, like we had mentioned, and I think it was mentioned before at the beginning of the, of, um, the sessions, Growing, you know, growing better. We can do that physically, you know, of course we can do that. But ultimately, spiritually and as families, we all need to, um, we all need to grow. And we recognize for us that there's a lot of work that God needs to continue to do through us. And we've said to him, and we say it not in a flippant way, but we, we say to God, we've seen you answer and do miracles, answer prayers and do miracles for the farm, but now we're saying to him, don't answer for the farm. Don't answer, because we need our family saved. Save that energy, help to save our family. So that's our prayer, that's our cry. Absolutely, <laughs> amen, that's right. Okay, are we but doing this one? We are just gonna um, end out very quickly. I know we've run over time, but we're just gonna end out very quickly in, in a song, which I'm hoping that um, will still leave you with encouragement. I hope so. I don't sing, but we're going to attempt this. <laughs> we're going to attempt it. <laughs> no singer. Can I? No, I just I can stay here. Looking 
good. 